because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed on the ocean, a vapor in Catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? That the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading. Here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours, I am yours. Good morning. Good morning. God's blessings upon you this day. We're glad that you have chosen to be here at Pilgrim Congregation, the United Church of Christ in Lansing, Michigan. This is February 26th of 2023. This is the first Sunday in the church season of Lent. Today we'll be having a reading from the beginning of Genesis and about Jesus in the wilderness. The stories are about facing temptation. In one story, people give in to temptation with dire consequences for themselves and for the rest of humanity. In the other story, a person resists temptation and with the later consequences of bringing about the salvation of humanity. May God bless our worship today. Amen. Here now is the news from Pilgrim Church on this February 26, 2023. You were all invited to our fellowship time after worship in the parish hall. Last Wednesday, we had our Ash Wednesday service. Not many people came in person because of the ice storm in our area, but you can view it on Pilgrim's website, Facebook page, and YouTube. Last Wednesday, we were supposed to tour that church on Jolly Road but because of the inclement weather, the tour was canceled. We have photos inside and outside of the church. They are on a table in the fellowship hall. Please take time to look through them. This coming Wednesday at noon, we will have the first of our five midweek Lenten services. The services will be on Wednesdays at noon, on March 1st, 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. For the midweek services, Pastor Peter has some dramatic presentations and will lead a time of meditation and prayer. We're still looking for a person or persons to act in the church clerk's position. I've made that announcement several times over the last several weeks. Um, and just as an FYI, if we don't get a volunteer pretty soon, I'm gonna have to start making assignments. So um, raise your hand if you can. Interestingly enough, we've done a number of different things with the clerk's position. Uh, the position, the responsibilities of the clerk are varied, but the primary duty is to be the person who takes notes at the monthly EMT meetings and to make the official call for formal meetings of the congregation. Uh, taking notes can be just that, taking notes. I've already had one person 
offer to transcribe those notes. So if you just, you know, if your handwriting is legible and you'd like to just volunteer for one month or so, please see me, Ted Grins, or contact Karen Davis, our, uh, uh, and we will be able to help you out with that. And again, it doesn't have to be a full year's commitment. You can just volunteer for a month or two or maybe even three. Our small children's closet is continuing to help the children and the parents in the community. They could always use people's help. We are still accepting donations to our strengthening the church offering. Uh, that offering is used by our denomination to help new churches get started and to assist old churches in their ministry of youth and young adults. Now there's an awful lot of need in the world right now. Uh, relief efforts continue for the victims of that deadly earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and we are collecting offerings to help those people. You can contribute to relief efforts for the Ukrainians where the war continues. There's an envelope for you to designate where your offering should go. They're found in your pew, and if you wish to contribute, please write a check out to Pilgrim Church with either earthquake or Ukraine relief in the memo line. Finally, we want to thank those of you who have continued to support Pilgrim with your time, your abilities, and your financial resources. Those donations allow the ministry of Pilgrim Church to continue. Thank you. Now, take a moment, stand up if you can, and pass the peace to your neighbor. Please be seated, and now Judy Knott will lead us in a meditation. This is called Ceaseless Prayer. I would like you to sit comfortably with your hands joined in prayer. Close your eyes and center yourself with breathing. On the in-breath, silently say the words, Jesus Christ, Son of God. And on the out-breath, finish with the words, have mercy on me. Say the words slowly and with intent. Savor each word. You might want to shorten the words to God on the in-breath, and on the out-breath, have mercy. Say the words on each inhalation and exhalation. Be attentive. When your mind wanders, simply turn back to your focus to the words and their meaning.
This can be repeated time after time all through the week. Amen. Thank you, Judy. Join me now in the invocation. Let us pray. God, we have begun a journey, a spiritual journey. We ask you to be our guide and our companion along the way. Set our feet on the solid ground of faith, and when the world grows dark, be a light to our path. We know that we don't have to see the end if you will journey with us. We know there will be distractions and temptations to take us off the course of spiritual renewal, but help us to receive encouragement from the example of Jesus, who resisted the temptations to misuse his authority and forsake his mission. May we use the gifts you have given us faithfully and wisely in your service. May we be aware of your presence as we give you our praise and thanks for all your blessings. Make us attentive to your spirit's direction. Amen. Listen now while Tammy does a rendition of Amazing Grace on the Bells. Please join me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Come, people of God, to declare once again that God is sovereign of all. We humbly acknowledge that God is Lord of our lives, and we come to give God our thanks. Leave the idols of this world and worship the one God who is in all and above all. We open ourselves to receive the gifts and the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that we may serve God with our hearts. 
seek spiritual strength and endurance from the presence of God's Holy Spirit. We reach out to God and open our hearts to receive the Holy Spirit. May those who are able please stand for our opening song. In Cheddar Gorge in England in the 1770s, a young minister, August Toplady, suddenly found himself in a storm while on a hike. He found shelter under an overhang of rock. He then made the connection of this rock, saving him from the storm with Jesus Christ, the rock of ages, saving us from sin and death. Let's all sing Rock of Ages, verses 1, 2, and 4. pray together. Holy God, creator of the universe, we confess our transgressions before you. We have been tempted to be less than what you want us to be. Many of us have failed to accept the reality that we are a son or daughter of you, O God. We have often confused freedom with, with self-indulgence. At, At times, we have misplaced our worship in the things, things of this world instead of you. Forgive us, O God, and equip us to be humble and honest in loving service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to know who we truly are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is the first Sunday in Lent, and the scriptures today are about temptation. First up is the first temptation of human beings in the Garden of Eden. The first humans are tempted to disobey God, and they give in to temptation. Their disobedience has profound consequences. For gaining knowledge of good and evil, they lose paradise and their close relationships with God. This is Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat 
of the fruit of the trees in this garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, nor shall you, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Tammy will do beneath the cross of Jesus. It says in your bulletin that <clears throat> Carolyn Pope had a history lesson for us, but she is ill today, so she is not with us, so we'll just move right on and do some amazing grace. God's grace sets us free. God's grace breaks the chains of sin, shame, and guilt that tie us down and weakens our spirits. We are set free. We sing the traditional words of the hymn, Amazing Grace, with the declaration that my chains are gone.
ransomed me, and like a flood, God's mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord Our second scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 4. After his baptism, <coughs> Jesus is compelled by the Holy Spirit to go out into the wilderness. There in the desert, Jesus prepares himself for his mission and ministry ahead of him. He fasts and prays to discipline <coughs> himself for the work to come. Physically weak, Jesus is tempted to misunderstand his identity to misuse his power, and to deviate from his mission. The temptation of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, <clears throat> command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, God will command his angels concerning you, and... On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. God bless our word for today. May we be granted insight into its meaning and purpose. <clears throat> today the scripture passages are a contrast in responses. One is an example of obedience, and the other is an example, well, one is disobedience, one is obedience. First scripture comes from the creation of human beings in the book of Genesis. God creates a man and a woman and puts them in the garden with the responsibility of taking care of the garden. God gives them some instructions about tending the garden and sets some limits and boundaries. And God tells them that they can eat freely of any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, we all know the story of what happened. A serpent, talking serpent, mind you, convinces the man and the woman to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They disobey God and they eat the fruit. They do not die as God had threatened, but when they eat the fruit, the scriptures say that their eyes were opened 
and they became aware of things that they had not been aware of before. Their innocence was gone, and they were now conscious of what good and what is evil. God had sought to keep human beings innocent of good and evil so that they could live in a state of consciousness like that of a child. But natural human curiosity to know, combined with a little enticement from a source promising great benefits, moved the man and the woman to disobey God's commandments and eat something God had told them they should not do. And the scriptures say that the man and the woman ate the fruit because it looked good to eat and they desired to be wise. Many people still fall for those two reasons. They take something or they try something because it looks pleasurable to eat, use, possess, or to do. Trouble is, what looks good to eat is not always good for you. What looks like fun to use turns uh, out to be hurtful, harmful. What seems to be good to possess actually turns out to harm us because wanting and having are not the same, and we get possessed by our possessions. And what looks like fun to do can have dire consequences if not thought through. How many tragedies start with, hey, watch this, or that doesn't look so tough? Many people interpret God's cautions in Genesis chapter 2 as a test for the man and the woman. God told them not to eat the fruit, which actually encouraged them to eat the fruit. Human curiosity, you know. But I don't think it was a test. I think like many other instances of God's commands, God was really looking out for their welfare. God's commandments were given to us not as a test of our obedience, but rather as the means for us all to get along and have it peacefully. No? Look at the Ten Commandments, for example. Following the Ten Commandments allows us to know our limits and the limits of other people's behavior. And knowing those limits and living within those bounds allows our communities and our society to function peacefully and productively. Major problem is, though, that there are people who want more than what they need. They want the false security of having more. When it comes to the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden, God knew that people would be happier living in innocence, unaware of the distractions of good and evil. Because once you start learning the difference between good and evil, then you have to be continually learning the differences between good and evil. You cannot go back to being innocent. If you stop learning which is which, you will fall into evil very easily. There was a time in our lives, each one of our lives, when we were not aware of good and evil. Every human being goes through a transformation. We start out as a baby, unaware of anything, but, feeling, uh, but a feeling of being uncomfortable and comfortable. You know, we don't even know that we are hungry, we just know we feel uncomfortable. But as time goes on, we become more and more aware of ourselves and our surroundings. We learn that there is a pain of hunger and a pain of injury, for example. We learn that we are a part of the universe, but that we are a separate entity in the universe. And some of us even learn that the universe does not revolve around us. In a sense, each of us experiences a fall like the first man and woman did. They abruptly fell into consciousness when they ate the fruit, while most of us fall into consciousness gradually as we grow up. The first man and woman did not have the chance to grow up and become aware of things gradually. They were created as adolescents. So let us not be too judgmental of them. 
But because of their fall into consciousness and awareness, they were forced out of the idyllic garden that God had made for them and into the harsh wilderness of being estranged from God's presence. And we human beings have been walking in the wilderness ever since. Of course, when we say wilderness, what we mean is a wild place. It is a place absence of civilization. So the Upper Peninsula is a wilderness of trees. Antarctica is a wilderness of snow and ice. The Arctic tundra is a wilderness. And in the Bible, a wilderness is almost always a desert. These are physical places of wilderness. But especially in this season of Lent, we can refer to spiritual and psychological places in our hearts and our minds as a wilderness of our soul. We can find ourselves lost in a wilderness of confusion or a wilderness of despair or a wilderness of emptiness or many other conditions of our spiritual state. And from time to time, all of us have been lost in a spiritual wilderness looking for a way out to a better condition. After Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit led him out into a physical wilderness, the desert. Here, or there, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in order to prepare himself for the challenge ahead of him in his earthly ministry. He needed to find his inner strength and determination to understand his mission and to courageously live it out. His human part needed to be disciplined. Matthew's gospel says that Jesus was famished and the tempter came to him. Now the tempter is also called the devil and Satan in this passage. All the same figure. The devil tempted or the devil tempter, whichever you want to call him, has come to confuse Jesus and to misguide him. Three temptations are described. In the first two temptations, the devil prefaces his temptation by calling into question Jesus' identity. The devil says, if you are the Son of God, if the devil is, you, is issuing Jesus a challenge, to prove that he is the Son of God. And if he takes the bait, Jesus would misuse his power for his own purposes and not for the purpose that God desires for him. In the first attempt to misdirect Jesus from his true identity, the devil uses Jesus' state of hunger to suggest that Jesus turn the stones into bread so he can eat. Now what's wrong with that? Why not use your power to have, you know, to satisfy your own needs? But Jesus did not come out into the wilderness to do magic tricks. He came into the desert to discipline his body and to find the strength to remain faithful to God's calling. To discipline the body and to strengthen your resolve, you need to deny yourself any indulgences. So Jesus responds, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In order for us to truly live, we need something beyond physical food. We need something to feed our spirits as well. God created the world and all that is in it by speaking. God spoke the word. God's word gives our lives purpose and meaning. God's word directs our lives so that we can live abundantly the best way that we can. God's word gives us life. We should seek it in reading the scriptures and praying to God for guidance. God's word is life. The second challenge the devil issues to Jesus to prove his identity as the son of God is by having Jesus save himself from a great fall off the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. The devil quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus to convince him of the legitimacy of his request. Other people will use scripture to mislead us and misdirect us. 
or maybe in our desire to find an affirmation of our own opinion, we will misread the scripture and twist its meaning to our own liking rather than to what's really there. Did Jesus have doubts about whether he was the Son of God or not? He does not seem to doubt, but the devil was hoping to take advantage of whatever doubt that he had to misdirect Jesus and his ministry. But Jesus responds to the devil. He quotes as well with a quotation of his own. It is written, do not put God to the test. Do we have doubts that we are children of God? Do you have a doubt that you are a son or daughter of God? And with those doubts, do we try to put God to the test? Faith is not believing that God will protect you or save you from heartache or disease or injury. Faith is trusting that God is with you through whatever hardship or tragedy may happen to you. Faith is trusting that your soul is safe with God, <clears throat> even though your body may be broken and beaten. Faith is trusting that God is good, even when a whole bunch of bad things are happening to you. Putting God to the test is not faith, nor is it trust. Sensing that Jesus is firm in his identity of God's son, the devil tries another approach by taking Jesus to a very high vantage point where he shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world. <clears throat> the devil thinks, okay, Jesus, you are not in this ministry because you are out to indulge yourself, nor are you in it for your own fame and fortune. Maybe you're in it for doing good in the world. The devil offers to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. And I think that this is the temptation that many politicians give in to. Do you want to do good in the world? Do you want to make this world a better place? So what if you were offered all the political power in the world to accomplish good for people? The only catch is that you have to worship someone who desires the destruction of the world and the corruption of your soul. All you have to do is replace God with the devil. There is a saying that the ends justifies the means, meaning that the results that you obtain are more important than what means you use to get there. Most people and most organizations, including churches, operate with this philosophy. So what if you have to compromise some ethics or even morals to get the job done? Problem is, the way I read the scripture, God is more interested in how we get to a result than the result itself. I believe that the Christian way of doing things is summed up in the saying, the means justifies the ends. The way we get somewhere is more important than accomplishing the task. Are we honest? Do we include other people in the decision? Are we respectful of God and all other people? The Christian way is for the means to justify the ends. We are to be faithful, not necessarily successful. Jesus responds to the devil. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship God and serve only God. Jesus will not compromise his way to do good in the world. He will worship God and trust in God's guidance. And when we are lost in the wilderness of life, going through our spiritual deserts, we should worship only God and trust in doing things God's way. Well, God bless us all. Amen. Let us all be in a spirit of prayer now. Let us pray. Help us, God, when we are unsure of where we are going or even where we are. When the society we live in is in confusion and turmoil. 
and we are feeling lost for a direction in our own lives, and the future is uncertain. We need your guidance to know which way we should go. We need your strength to endure the doubts and disarray, and we need your comforting presence to tell us that we may be lost in the world, but we are never lost from you. Be the rock of our existence that gives us our lives a stable base in which we can face and endure the upheaval in the world around us. Help us to resist the temptation of being anything but a child of God. Open our hearts to be fully aware of your love and grace. Guide us in your ways and give us the courage and strength to do what you ask of us. May respect for one another abound so prejudice and racism may end and justice prevail. We need your healing power to mend the divisions in our society and families. We need your healing power upon those who are sick, those who are injured, those who are weighed down with fear and anxiety, and those who have lost someone special to them. We resolve to promote love and peace. We resolve to grow in our spirituality and deepen in our devotion of you. Make our spirits whole and healthy. O oh God, by your grace, we are saved. May we serve you wholeheartedly. In our love for you, God, we come together in spirit and voice with the prayer of our Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The original words of <clears throat> O Sacred Head Now Wounded were written in Latin by the famous monk Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century. It was a common practice in medieval mon monastic orders to spend hours contemplating Jesus on the cross. The words reflect part of Bernard's meditative experience of the crucifix. Paul Gerhardt translated the words into German and wrote the music in the 17th century. Then James Alexander translated the German hymn into English in the 19th century. During Lent, it is proper to meditate upon the suffering of Christ on the cross and the sacrifice he made for us. May all of those who are able please rise for our closing song, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, all three verses. Surrounded with 
out into the world bravely, you will face many temptations and trials in life, but God will be with you to uphold you and give you strength. Remember that one does not live by bread alone, and we must rely on the word of God and the Holy Spirit as well. Remember that God alone deserves our worship, and to worship anyone or anything else is to eventually destroy oneself. Trust God to guide you on the right path. May God's grace and love surround you this day and always. God bless you. Amen. For the season of Lent, our postload response will be, Won't you let me be your servant? Verse 2. The words are in the bulletin. <laughs> bless you all.